us, our Lord Emmanuel. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, and it's a great joy to be with you today on this second Sunday of Advent. And I want to thank your Rector Duncan and also Zachary and Claire, all of them for their great ministries and the ministries of all of you to make this one of the outstanding churches of the Diocese of Long Island. The first time I've ever been here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Six years I've been in the Diocese. I've never been here. So I've heard a lot of good things and I see that it's all true. During the weeks leading up to Christmas, I like to keep my radio in my office turned on to one of those stations that plays Christmas music all the time. And of course, it's my station is WQXR, which is the holiday channel, which is just a wonderful, wonderful thing if you can get access to it. Of choral music, carols, um, terrific things. And so I like listening to that, but about just about every store I go to to pick up some early Christmas presents is so often playing the little drummer boy. I can't stand that song, so <laughs> I'm just telling you that. And I think I've heard it enough times in my life, I never want to hear it again. So I bring little <laughs> plugs for my ears. Also, I can't stand rocking around the Christmas tree either. I think that's <laughs> one of the worst. So that's why I go to WQXR. They never play these. On the other hand, I'm always happy to read the first lesson and the gospel appointed for this second Sunday of Advent, these wonderful lessons we've just heard. Because as you might have noticed, they inspired several parts of Handel's great Christmas oratorio, Messiah. What would Christmas be without the Messiah? And so think of these that we heard already in these lessons today, and he shall purify, and every valley shall be exalted. I think that's one of the most wonderful phrases of the Bible. And there it is, uh, right in Handel's Messiah. Every valley shall be exalted. Nobody's going to be left out where you live, where you work, where you play. So go listen again to the Messiah online. There's a new book which is out, which is about the whole way in which this great, great piece of music, which touches every one of us. Who is ashamed ever to stand up when we sing the Hallelujah Chorus? I mean, that's one of the great moments of Christmas every year. So our readings this morning are about messengers, people who bring us God's word, people who are telling us what's going to happen. And often it is the creators of sacred music like Handel, who are the messengers, since we will be listening to so much Christmas music in the weeks ahead. Please let me introduce you to my favorite messenger, the Right Reverend Phillips Brooks, one of my special heroes, who wrote one of our favorite hymns, which I'll talk about in a minute. Brooks was the greatest preacher in America in the 19th century. Can you imagine that the Episcopal Church in the 19th century had the greatest preacher in America? But we did. He was this fantastic, fantastic preacher and leader of our church. He was born in 1835 and will celebrate his birthday this coming Friday. So think a little bit about what I'm talking about today when you remember Brooks on Friday. He was the Bishop of Massachusetts and before that, he was the rector of Trinity Church, Copley Square in Boston, in downtown Boston, this great, great church that even in his time had 4,000 members, which is pretty big also for an Episcopal church. And it's the church that, believe it or not, called me to ordained ministry. So I have a particular love of that church. Brooks made surpassing contributions to the life of the Episcopal church. He was a great advocate, even in the 19th century, for social justice and for trying to bring justice in terms of the workplace and in terms of sharing the goods of the earth with the people of Boston, Massachusetts, and the United States. 
But what I want to talk to you today about is the fact that he is the person who wrote the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, which I think is a hymn that speaks so much to this moment in our life as an Episcopal church and as our life as the United States of America. The words of that hymn have so much to say to us in these dark times at home, in America, and in the Holy Land that I cannot resist taking this opportunity this morning to unpack this a little bit. I love this so much that I'm, when I'm forced by my wife to do the dishes at home, I often turn on WQXR and listen to A Little Town of Bethlehem because it, to me, it summarizes what Christmas is about. And you know the words. It's hymn 79 in the hymn book if you want to look it up while I'm talking. But the opening words are so beautiful. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I can't think of a better Christmas carol. Hopes and fears. The dark night but also the stars of hope shining above the streets of Bethlehem. Brooks was inspired by a trip he made to the Holy Land in December 1865. So before he came to Boston, he was the rector of Holy Trinity Church in uh, Philadelphia, Rittenhouse Square, through the Civil War. And he was a great advocate of the North in the Civil War, whereas Philadelphia was really divided, believe it or not, between North and South. He rode out to Gettysburg and served as a nurse to the, the United States Army soldiers who fell during that battle. He nurtured them. He was at Gettysburg. He really tried to keep Philadelphia on the side of the Union during those horrible times. And then he was worn out <laughs> by this, as you would imagine. So he took a vacation after the war was over, and he went to the Holy Land. And he got a horse, he, he rented a horse, and he rode to, to uh, Bethlehem. And he wanted to be there and see what it was like to be on the night that Jesus was born. He attended a Christmas Eve service that lasted from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. So, Duncan, I'm not inviting you to have a service like that this year. <laughs> Even though I like Philip Brook, I don't think anybody would come next year if you did it. But three years later, when he came back home and he needed a carol for his Sunday school Christmas pageant, he composed a poem that was based on his experience of that night in Jerusalem after the Civil War. And his organist at um, Holy Trinity in Philadelphia wrote the music. We have an American version. You know, there's an English version. I'm hoping you will sing the American version on, on Christmas Eve. But how perfectly this hymn describes our situation this year in 2024. He offers us the great hope of Christmas. Christmas is about hope. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in Bethlehem that night. Just as we are meeting the hopes and fears and heartbreak of war in the Holy Land, of war in the Ukraine, of the worry of many people about the future of our own country. We're a divided country right now. Every front page of the newspaper has that atmosphere of worry, I think. Think about last Wednesday, the head of United Healthcare, one of our great healthcare organization was shot dead in, in front of the Hilton Hotel on 6th Avenue in Manhattan. I mean, and he's still on the loose. So if we want to kind of assemble of why did this happen to this guy, I think some people are upset about they're not getting the health care they think they need. I don't know, but what I wanted to say to you this morning is that this great hymn speaks about hopes and fears. It's not bad to have fears, but we need to balance those fears with hopes. We have injustice. We have things that are threatening us. But those were the same fears that our country experienced in the Civil War and that Phillips Brooks had helped to lead Philadelphia through in that war. 
and tried to encourage his people by the writing of this great hymn. It was, the, that was not a time unlike ours. But we do so knowing that there is hope. We do so knowing that in Jesus Christ, there is everlasting life. The people who walk through this door of this church, and I know you have people all the time, new people coming in, may never have heard this good news, may be worried about the future, about the price of eggs, about what's going to happen with their jobs. This church stands here to make that hope available and to make it available in the way that the Episcopal Church does. Countless people's lives have been transformed when they walked through that door and came into our church for the first time. I'm not here today to say we're the only Christian church. You know I don't believe that. But I'm saying that we, everybody in this room can have a testimony to the fact of what this church has meant to you in giving you a sense of a Christianity of hope and a way to deal with fears. In a later verse, we sing in this great carol, cast out our sin and enter in and be born in us today. Do you hear what I just said? The hymn says, be born in us, part of the incarnation, part of the coming of Jesus, is that God is also born in us, Phillips Brooks is saying. I mean, that's a big deal, I think, if we think that we have. We connect to God and Jesus Christ in the Holy Communion up here. But we also connect to God in the way we celebrate this coming of the God's Son. This is the gift of Christmas that comes anew every year. As we sing in verse 3, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. That's what I'm talking about. Your mission right here. When somebody goes into this door, the dear Christ might enter into their heart. And they're transformed. And something happens to that. And person after person after person in your town needs to know that they're welcome to come into this. Jesus was born in a world desperately need, in need of love. The Romans were occupying his native land. Society was divided between rich and poor. Not unlike Phillips Brooks' time and our time. A world in which we are awaiting the messengers who will reassure us that eventually hate and fear and division will give way to hope. And a building of community between everybody, no matter what our political points of view are. So as we listen to the nonstop carols this Christmas, what are we hoping for? We're hoping for the love that heals the aching heart. We're hoping for peace around the world. So the Holy Land and Ukraine are no longer battlefields. We're hoping for the survival of civilized values in a world that seems each day more uncivilized in various ways. This morning, I invite you to look past whatever dark street you think you're facing and turn away from that dark street and look to the everlasting life. You anticipate Christmas in this beloved church and a celebration which says what verse 4 says in the hymn, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door. The dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. Just more than two weeks from today is Christmas Eve. Jesus is almost here. Well, he is here, I think. I think I know you all believe that, but you know what I'm saying. He comes to us in this Christmas way, which we love so much. We need him in his majesty and in his glory as the king of the universe, but we also need him in his, as this innocent child, this child who brings hope to us, who comes to us, oh, come to us, abide with us. That's what the hymn says. If we pay attention to only one Christmas carol played over and over on the radio in the stories this year, let it be this one. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, oh, come to us, 
abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Thanks be to God for this great parish which opens its doors and allows people to know Jesus. St. John's Huntington, here on the north shore of Long Island, in the state of New York, and in the United States of America. Amen. Amen.